A new study says the southwest corner of Camp Pendleton is ideal for a new international airport. The empty terminals at Palomar Airport in North County may be busy again, or not. A new cross-border terminal and bridge to Tijuana's airport aids travelers to and from Mexico. And San Diego emerges as a serious, affordable contender to be the next Silicon Valley. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John. Hi, Allison. Happy to be here, Mark. Good to have you back. Jean Guerrero, Fronteras reporter for KPBS. Hi, Jean. Hi, Mark. Nice to see you. Glad to have you today. And Roger Scholey, who covers growth and development for the San Diego Union Tribune. Hi, Roger. Hi, Mark. We're glad to have you here today. Well, for longer than many of us have been alive, planners and politicians have been talking about building a new regional airport. Lindbergh Field has been considered inadequate on several levels and is to reach capacity in just 20 years. Plenty of sites have been suggested, but this week a study released by Cal State San Marcos says the best site for a new international airport is on Camp Pendleton. Allison, start with the specifics of this. Uh, what are they mm -hmm. saying? And uh, this is a study that's built on some other looks at this, right? Well, exactly, yes. And, and essentially it's built on some of the research that was done before the last time we were looking for another airport. And the students decided to settle on Camp Pendleton. And the, 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 if you can imagine the, uh, the road I-5 going up there past Camp Pendleton, it's just on the very south edge of Camp Pendleton and just north of Oceanside. Okay. So um, it would have the San Luis Rey River running through there. And on the other side of that, that valley, there are hills. They would put these two airstrips on the hills on the very south edge of the base. Okay, and I alluded in the open there to the need for an airport. We do have four big airports in Southern California, but the, the need is pretty clear, is it not? Well, I think that's what's interesting is that they chose that area partly because they feel that people in Orange County and Southern Riverside County would benefit as well as San Diego. So it would serve a population of 2.2 uh, million at the moment, they say, by the time this would get built, which if it ever did would be at least a couple of decades, uh, would be around 2.7 million people. So there'd be quite a lot of people there who, uh, if the roads are getting worse, as we all experience they are, you know, would be struggling to get to the closest international airport from oh, that so region. Roger? Um, uh, what the, of course, the first question is, what do the Marines think of this? Well, yes, the Marines have responded um, very, in a very dignified fashion to say they will review the proposal, <laughs> but that essentially we're not aware of the incredible importance of their base to our national security and that the training facilities involve, um, you know, facilities in Nevada and Arizona, and there's a link which is absolutely irreplaceable. It's the largest training air and land-based training facility in the nation, possibly the world, mm -hmm. so that they say even taking five to 6,000 of their 125,000 acres would compromise their mission and compromise national security as a result. So does the federal government have the first say on whether this should go forward beyond just blue sky thinking? Um, you know, if you're going to go straight to the biggest obstacle of this, I think you might end up in a dead end. Mm. But I think that um, there are various people who feel like the need for uh, another airport in San Diego is great enough that we need to start at least opening a dialogue with people to see whether uh, it would be feasible to look at the economic benefits, to look at the cost, how it might be financed. And, you know, politics, it's unpredictable. In 20 mm -hmm. years, the whole situation might be very different. It's always impossible to, to really tell what the military situation might be. Right now, the military is moving their focus to the Pacific Rim and moving a lot of the resources mm -hmm. to the West Coast. So it seems like this is not a good time to be asking them to I have a third wait. question. Go ahead, Roger. Um, well, I mean, they have Miramar and they have Camp Pendleton. So they being the military. So yeah. we can't go to... Camp Pendleton wanted to give us Miramar. I mean, is there sort of bargaining in there? I did wonder if there <laughs> in, in, in a draft a choice to be named later, yeah. <laughs> because uh, really, without some backing from some influential people, I think this wouldn't go very far. So Irwin Jacobs mm -hmm. and uh, Melan Burnham have both said they're very interested in this idea. And this could be a way of putting a little bit of more pressure on the military and saying, look, we, we are a military town. We support the military. But the military needs to also support the community that it's a part of. You said no to Miramar. How about a little corner of Camp Pendleton? And, you know, it could be that there may be some thinking that perhaps the, the military might start thinking, well, 
Miramar would be better than Pendleton. Mm -hmm. But it's but clear we really do need a new airport here in, in this region. Huh? Well, um, you, you talked to, um, I was talking to Keith Wilshets, uh, um, Wilshets from the airport authority, and, you know, he, he says that the plan is coming to an end or reach capacity at 2035. Um, however, there doesn't seem to be a sense of urgency, which is kind of surprising, bearing in mind that it would take at least 20 years to position a new airport. And how much money and who would pay for it? Well, according to the students, the MBA students at Cal State San Marcos, they're saying it would need a new model from all the 20th century airport modeling, um, which was based on bonds and public mm -hmm. funding. They're saying, no, this would need a 21st century model of funding and um, public-private partnerships is the way to go, and possibly attracting a major international airline to come to that site and help them design it as a mega hub right from the start and, and put in some funding would, would be the, a way to go. the ballpark price tag on this? That well, they say less than $10 million. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd double it. <laughs> it been 20 years? Yes, yeah. yes. All right, well, there are many more questions on that, and I know you're going to do a lot more reporting, but we are going to shift gears to a related story that you also did this week. You've been busy this week. Uh, the existing um, McClellan Palomar Airport in Carlsbad, they're fixing to expand. Not everybody's happy about that. The county supervisors are going to vote. Uh, tell us, what's the status of that airport now, and what's the proposal on well, the table? The interesting thing about that airport is that it's really busy, and a lot of people have no idea there's this little airport, less than 5,000 foot runway in Carlsbad, but none of those aircraft are for commercial airline traffic at the moment. They're all private jets. Not even the short hops and the little Not even jumpers. the short hops. Yeah. There was a fairly successful um, United uh, SkyWest operation out of there for a couple of years that was flying to L.A., and 50,000 people uh, a year were, were using it. But then um, Biz Air tried, there have been a number of airlines that have tried out of there and have not been able to come up with a business model. So, mm -hmm. you know, the airport manager, Olivier Brackett, says that he has another one up his sleeve that may um, be announced early next mm -hmm. year. But it seems like that runway is just too short. That's the big for the, problem yeah. here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the uh, the plan here? Uh, how, how much we're... How you, you mentioned, I think, it's 800 feet, is that right? Well, the, the, the recommended option for the master plan says that a possibility of expanding it 800 feet, mm. although that's not the first thing that would be done. The first thing that would be done would be to put um, safety, they call them EMASs, there are those things like truck stops mm. um, that stop the plane from running off the end of the runway at each end, because the FAA would probably fund 90% of those safety features. Mm -hmm. uh, extending the runway could cost a lot more than you would imagine, because the site is on the side of an old landfill. Mm -hmm. So right where you'd want to put that 800 feet is an old landfill that would need piers to be sunk. Ah, so you've got environmental so, reviews so, and problems there. And well, yes, and, and the question is, you know, if the FAA wasn't going to pay for the extension of the runway, which they wouldn't, uh, do we want to spend tens of millions of dollars of public money on an airline, on an airport, where it's almost all commercial, it's all private uh, corporate Mm -hmm. aircraft. General aviation and, and private aircraft. Right, yeah. rather than the general public. I see. So that's the the, the, and the argument, but it's the catch-22. If you don't build it, we can't go commercial, and if you That's you know, right. It is a bit it, of a catch-22. Yeah, is you're, it that much? You're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, you mentioned the FAA would, would fund 90% of the safety stuff, but that's not the whole cost here. Where would the funding come from? As you say, tens of millions more just to Well, it's interesting the because the, the, the item on the agenda next week at the supervisor's um, meeting says there is no fiscal impact which um, means that this is just, this is just a plan. Um, and I, I feel like this is fairly typical of the way things sometimes happen in incremental steps. So you think, oh, there's no problem here. But then if they say, yes, we like this, this proposal, then when the actual 800-foot extension comes down the line with a possible $70 million price tag, you know, it'll be difficult to go back and say, uh, no, we can't afford it because they've already said, yes, we think it's a good idea. And so there isn't really any talk yet about how it would be funded. Now, you interviewed uh, um, some of the, the neighbors for reaction. You interviewed Amanda Rigby, who is actually a city council member from uh, Vista. Some people are already upset just with the corporate jets. Let's hear that bite. When the FAA says you can't possibly know there's an aircraft, if there is, it's so high above you, you'd never see it or hear it. If we're experiencing that much noise and rattling windows and things falling off shelves, those aircraft are over our homes and they are low and they are bigger than the weekend aircraft. The Vista City Council is considering writing to the FAA to ask for flight paths to be realigned. There obviously is something going on here and they're just not being honest with us about it, so it really makes us all wonder 
what is the end game here? All right, so what is the end game what here? Is the end? I think that is what everyone's wondering. It's not just Carlsbad, and it's interesting that the people in South Vista, a neighboring community, have really noticed an increase in, in noise going over their community. And one wonders, are the planes being diverted over Vista so that Carlsbad residents don't object? It's, it's very hard to tell because mm -hmm. um, the, the FAA says they have not changed flight paths. But uh, Well, I, I guess when, uh, going back to history about all this, um, North County likes to think of itself as an independent county until they need regional facilities and they don't want to build them. So I wonder mm. if there's a NIMBY problem and yeah. anything down up there. All our ports NIMBY, yeah. Well, I, I, I feel like this, this has got to the point now where North County may have thought of itself as an independent, but it's becoming increasingly true as the freeways become mm -hmm. more and more clogged. Businesses in Carlsbad are finding themselves driving all the way up to John Wayne, which is twice as far as Lindbergh, because mm -hmm. the access to San Diego City is getting worse and so worse. And a sort of Last thing, real quick, we've got to move on. Uh, when's the vote on this again? The next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. We'll mm. watch the follow-up on that. All right. Well, let's head south now for another aviation story. This one involves a new and easier way for San Diegans to fly from Tijuana to other cities in Mexico. Uh, Gene, tell us about this new pedestrian bridge here. Where is it? And it's not just a bridge, it's a terminal and uh, gives the high points. Right, exactly. So it's an Otay Mesa. It's both in the United States and in Mexico, two thirds in the US and one third in Mexico. And it basically straddles the border. There's a terminal on the US side and then you've got the Tijuana airport on the Mexico side. And it's gonna make traveling back and forth across the border a lot easier for Tijuana airport passengers. They're just gonna be able to cross within less than five minutes and bypass all of the long lines at the regular ports of entry. All right, and that's a nice uh, segue into uh, a bite we have from one of these regular travelers, Carol Hopkins. She's a San Diegan who regularly travels down to the Mexican city of Cuernavaca. I fly back and forth almost every month uh, to Mexico because I have a business there, a small hotel. And the hassle of travel has been huge through the years. Usually, she has to walk about half a mile to cross the border, then take a taxi to the Tijuana airport. On the way back, she sometimes waits hours in border crossing traffic. So that process is pretty difficult if you're carrying a fair amount of luggage, and I usually am. And so this is so much easier. All right. Well, Carol there talks about the, uh, the, uh, how hassle-free relative to, to what the situation was there. But there's other advantages, right? The, the flights uh, themselves, the better times, the price of them? Exactly. A lot of San Diegans, when they're flying somewhere within Mexico, they, they opt to use the Tijuana Airport precisely because it's usually a lot cheaper. Um, I did a search just yesterday, and if you were leaving today to Mexico City, coming back on Sunday round trip from San Diego that would cost between three hundred and four hundred dollars from the Tijuana Airport it's less than two hundred dollars so, so it's a significant mm -hmm. chunk to not go from Lindbergh and go on down to Tijuana and this makes it so much easier well, Roger I have a personal uh, story to tell my wife is going to Mexico City for a meeting one a few months ago she had the choice of going to Tijuana or going to LA and she started worrying about the security and the backups and all the things getting through the border back and forth. She said, I'm going to drive to L.A. and go that way, which seems counter counterintuitive. But <laughs> it was quicker and more uh, uh, convenient in wow. a way. That's remarkable. Yeah. You're talking and about then, and the there hassle. Are, and, there are more places to go to mm -hmm. um, from Tijuana Airport. I mean, a lot of people would go from San Diego to L.A. because L.A. offers more options mm -hmm. than, this, than Lindbergh Field. Um, but Tijuana Airport has 34 different destinations to choose from. So if you want to go to a, a less touristy part of Mexico, a lot of people, they, they go to Tijuana it, so they can fly there. It is a larger uh, airstrip, I believe, right? I mean, they could be sending airlines to further destinations, international destinations um, in Asia, for example, couldn't they? Right, they could be. Um, there aren't currently any, any plans that I know of to expand much further. It's primarily a domestic airport. Most people who fly out of the Tijuana Airport are flying within Mexico. But they fly to Shanghai, don't they? They do, yeah. So they, that they already know that international works. Yeah, and but you wonder what, you wonder where the opening to Cuba and Havana if right. you go from here <laughs> to uh, many people consider as an exotic destination at this point with uh, the easing one, of the restrictions. One of the things that the Cal State San Marcos uh, research found was that most of the international flights leave from the west, uh, the east coast rather, to Europe, mm -hmm. um, and only like 30 percent or so go from the West Coast to the Pacific Rim, and bearing in mind that I think you know trade is really picking up with China and mm -hmm. and Japan, there is a big market there that could be 
um, that is underserved at the moment right. by airports. Right. Well, let me ask you about specifics about this now. It's a very unusual because it's uh, of, of how it was built and who paid for it and, and who owns it. Explain that for us. Right, so it's a completely privately funded um, cross-border airport terminal. So there's, there's um, actually no other fully privately funded port of entry along the U.S.-Mexico border. There are, um, like, there are bridges and other connections that are privately funded, but this one specifically, even the salaries of the CBP officials are privately funded. And CBP is? Oh, I'm sorry, the cu <laughs> Customs and, and Customs Border Protection. Folks, that's fine. So, um, yeah, so it's completely privately funded, um, in a big investor group, including a Chicago billionaire Sam Zell. How are they making their money back? Well, they so to use the bridge, you have to pay. Um, you have to buy a ticket, and it's an eighteen dollar one way ticket, or you could buy a thirty six dollar round trip ticket. Um, and only airport Tijuana airport passengers can use can use the bridge. Okay, and uh, yeah, so it's not for general folks heading down to go to the market or whatever else they might be doing. Right, exactly. You need to show proof. Um, you can buy your ticket either online or at the Cross Border Express website. It's called the Cross Border Express, Express without the first E, um, or at the terminal itself, and and you need to show evidence that you're going to be flying into or out of could, the Tijuana. Could you area. actually, you know, if somebody needs to race across the border, could you conceivably buy a ticket, pay the f fee, cross over into Mexico and then leave the terminal and go and do your business and do the other direction. I mean, I wonder, I bet some people are, would do that just to s save time. Well, if you had a, if you, are you talking about buying an actual airline ticket? Because you right. would need to have a flight. Right. So, I mean, I don't know if anyone would, I don't know how many people would be willing to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me ask you about security. Is that a concern here? How's that all being handled? You mentioned it's being paid privately. But. Right. I mean, there were some concerns, but I, t I spoke to U U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and they mentioned that this is going to operate exactly like any other port of entry with the exact same security measures in place. CBP worked very closely with the operator and the builder, um, Otay Tijuana Ventures, to make sure that all of the same security measures are in place. So, for example, if you're if you're going southbound into Mexico, CBP has the option to check ch check your stuff, as does Mexican Customs. And if you're coming into the United States, you will always have your passport checked, your baggage will go through x-rays, um, all, all of the same security measures that you would go through crossing through San however, Cedar. however you came mm -hmm. in. Well, is this expected to cause a drain on passengers and revenue at Lindbergh Field and the competition there? 20 miles apart, roughly, right, these airports? Right. Um, that's actually not expected to happen, primarily because of the fact that the Tijuana Airport is primarily serving um, Mexico destinations, so people are traveling within Mexico, and, and San Diego, it's mostly a domestic airport But it well. is, a, is a vision that people came up with many years ago to have a binational border airport either two on either, one on either side, or using Mexico or Tijuana as the regional airport as a, as a uh, augmentation to San Diego service. So it, instead of building one in $20 billion in Camp Ellen, and it's cheaper and quicker to build a, so, a increase the access in there. Tijuana. Well, we'll be watching your stories here and see, uh, I'm sure you'll be doing follow-ups on how that's going in uh, six months, a year down the, the road. All right, we'll shift gears now. Everyone knows the Bay Area is home to the tech engineering mecca known as Silicon Valley. It's even immortalized in a popular TV sitcom satire, but a new report says San Diego is ideally positioned to start giving our northern neighbors a run for their money. Roger, um, what is it about San Diego that's starting to attract some of these high-tech firms? Well, some things are, one reason is because San Francisco is getting difficult to do business in. It's it's uh, very expensive, it's crowded, uh, the companies that are there find it more difficult to expand, and they are thinking of moving, and normally they, if they move, they move or expand outside of California. So the San Diego uh, boosters hope that instead of doing that, they will steer them our way. Okay. And so we don't want, don't want to lose them entirely here, so right. bring them on down. So the then south. you say, well, there are other choices in California. Why would you come to San Diego? So San Diego has some advantages inherently in that it's cheaper than in San Francisco to live. The real estate is cheaper. Uh, the processes, are, while they're still complicated, are probably less um, less onerous, and onerous than in yeah. San Francisco uh -huh. and the whole Bay Area. Uh, plus, San Diego has, already has a biomed hub that's a very, very successful. It's the fourth biggest in the country. And it's compatible, of course, right. with what we're talking about. So uh, the JLL Jones, Jones Lang LaSalle is the company that did the study. They said that San Diego is ranked 18th right now in terms of um, tech hub opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we actually 
fare better than LA and just below Portland. So mm -hmm. there is a chance for growth. Now, let me ask you about, give us a couple examples of firms that have uh, or are abandoning or have abandoned the Bay Area and, and come on down here. Well, nobody's abandoned the Bay Area. They've, they've basically set up a, a sorry. Let's get a foot in, in both Diego. places. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, so right. one example is Fitbit, you know, the, the little thing that you wear on your wrist to measure your steps. They, they're setting up an R&D office in Rancho Bernardo. They already have one. They're moving to permanent headquarters very soon. Another one is GoPro, founded by UC San Diego alumnus. They're based in San Mateo, but they... Um, That's, of course, the camera, the wide action camera right. you put on your, your so, so head they, when you're they, skiing or riding your bike. They had know. an office in San Diego, and they've expanded to yeah. one in Carlsbad. Okay. And then Lumadine is a new company that Google bought recently last year, and they are they build sensors, and maybe that's for their uh, the Google car. So they're going to be doing expanding their um, research operations in San Diego. So as somebody said, if Google is interested in San Diego, maybe mm -hmm. I should be interested in San Diego. So if you talk about the talk to the economic boosters of San Diego, the economic development people, uh, they say, well, we're still focusing on keeping San Diego companies from moving. And we're always willing to talk to other companies that might want to move here, mm -hmm. or expand here. Allison? Well, just uh, GoPro right there in Carlsbad, I'm sure they're one of the companies that are thinking that it would be much more convenient for them to be able to fly out of Carlsbad mm -hmm. than to take the the, right. the the terrible traffic on five. And I read an interesting letter in the in the Union, your paper, San Diego Union Tribune this morning from, I think it might be our former um, program director, Mike Flaster, making the point that he had gone to UCSD and talked to a bunch of um, people there about how we spend so much energy on the chargers. We are mm -hmm. really focused on this dilemma about the chargers. And meantime, the really important things for really developing our region, such as infrastructure, such mm -hmm. as you know roads and public transit and education, are sort of taking a, a back seat to this 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 this. Well, there are there, there are plenty of developers, uh, office developers, who are uh, chomping at the bit to um, chomping at the bit to actually uh, get this market developed in San Diego. And our former owner, Doug Manchester, has this giant project at the foot of Broadway, and they have Cushman and Wakefield as their broker, and they are making a concerted effort to appeal to those companies in San Francisco. Now, let's talk about the comparative costs a little bit, because you mentioned that earlier, San, Francisco, or San Diego looks attractive compared with, but we're still a very expensive city. Explain yeah. some of the, break us down some of the numbers on the costs. Well, uh, the, no, the number they have, the, the bottom line number is that San Diego they, they, they measured salaries and real estate costs, and they said San Diego average cost per person is 112000 uh, including salary and what they cost per real estate. Now, when you say real estate, you mean where the workers are actually, yeah, not their so homes, no, but where the, they're it's working. No, it's the rent, that they, I mean the uh, lease that they're paying. Right, right. Uh, lease. And that's lower than uh, East Bay, Oakland, 127000 San Francisco is 187000 Silicon Valley is 219000 in the San Francisco Peninsula is 240,000. 240,000 <laughs> compared to 112. Well, you can yeah. see where the attraction mm -hmm. is. Though. Right. Of course, we're not as cheap as Phoenix or Denver right. or um, Portland or other mm -hmm. other out of state. But they're markets. not America's finest city. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, you, there was reference in your story too. Uh, San Francisco is a, uh, you know attractive from a lifestyle standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's this whole kind of squishy idea about dynamism. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? Well, they, they, I don't understand how they measured this, and they really didn't give me the numbers to explain it, but they measured walkability and transit and mm -hmm. the lifestyle, and, and San Diego came up three, and L.A. was number 10, which I said, that's impossible. How could that be? And they said, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't fall figure into their overall score. Nobody walks in L.A. Yeah, right. <laughs> as so uh, they, basically they said in the west side of L.A., in Santa Monica, it is walkable. Of course, mm -hmm. all of L.A. is not walkable, mm -hmm. yeah. but well, neither is San Diego. Neither is San Diego, right. right. But, but so. I do think the point you're sort of raising is that even though we have lower house prices, perhaps our infrastructure to just get around mm -hmm. is not as good for a right. business that really needs to have mobility. Right. This is one of the disadvantages for us. So, so the, I think the developers would say, but if you build a, put your office downtown, for example, like the Manchester Project, you can live and work there. You don't have to get on the freeways. Now downtown is basically a sub, a be bedroom suburb for Qualcomm and other North County uh, companies. And kind of turned around that it's way. It's just the yeah. reverse of what it was 50 yeah. years ago. So if if they can only get companies to start looking at and moving in San Diego, uh, then that will start to develop. All right, we got about a minute left. Let me ask you about uh, San Diego and where we stand when it comes to availability of investor capital compared yeah. with. Uh, well, that's North. that's a really sad thing about San Diego is that well, it's America's finest city. It's not the America's finest bank. Mm 
<laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a 200 and some million dollars uh, we got last year, and that's like uh, a fraction of what San Francisco gets in, in the billions. So, and again, we're talking about investors. Yeah. And, so and it doesn't. I don't quite understand how investors think because you're only we're only an hour flight from here to San Francisco. What? Why can't you just go back and forth and make your case to the investors up there? But there was one uh, company who said that they um, he left the company here, but he's moving back. He's moved back to San Francisco to, to beg for money from the San Francisco investors. So <laughs> that whole thing you think would be they're high tech. You think they'd be high tech about money, but they're very hands-on, they want to see you down the street and have coffee, make sure you're not yeah. my money. Well, if anything's fungible, it, it's money. We'll have to see how that all plays out. Well, that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Allison St. John of KPBS News, Jean Guerrero, also of KPBS, and Roger Scholey of the San Diego Union Tribune. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable.